The city of Afkatla, the city of trade. It sits as a central economic hub for all the surrounding lands. The rain is coming in like diagonal 45 degrees. The sun is so bright behind a thin layer of clouds that it's almost, it's like bright and raining at the same time, letting us see the sheet of rain as it falls. The rain, there's no thunder and there's no lightning, but the rain is falling with such force that it's causing a long droning white noise, causing the party members to not be able to hear much past themselves. This is also causing like flash flood circumstances. So as Cormac Darkdraft, leader of the Outsiders, is carrying his large carriage, well, the large carriage full of treasure and loot from their latest escapades, leading his team, you can't hear the heavy wooden wheels as they, they click and clack across the stone and beat up road, because um, we can only hear the rain. Of Kotla's, uh, the gates, they're open. That's not uncommon. But there's also a plume of smoke coming from almost dead near center of the city. Not the plume of smoke that you'd see in a fireplace or a smithy. This is a large plume of smoke. It billows and churns into the sky. Almost like a monolithic pillar of black in this bright, white, clouded sky. Cormac looks back, raising his voice to the rest of his team behind him. The outsiders, like I said, of the gauntlet. I wonder what that's all about. Cormac is seven, seven and a half feet tall, weighs 600 pounds, roughly, covered in plate mill. And he assuredly believes in the gauntlet message, the gauntlet way. No one begins to run. Afkatla is not under siege. The gates wouldn't be open. Unless Afkatla has fallen, but much more than one pillar of smoke would be coming out of the middle of it. Corman looks back. Walking up to his right, a halfling man. Even in this rain, his small vest jacket combo is open, showing his slightly hairy bared, bared chest. And his, his hair, which you could tell if it wasn't for the torrential rain, would probably be done into some sort of pompadour. And he's got mutton chops for days. <laughs> Looking ahead down towards the middle, he kind of like looks at it and in a small but gruff halfling voice, he says, I don't know, but it doesn't look good. Cormac stops once again. A drow to his left, a drow woman who is not hiding the fact that she's a drow, strange for these lands. Drow are unwelcome here. She cocks her head and looks. We don't know if she just happened to see it or if it's something to do with her drow and innate abilities. She's dressed in armor. She's obviously some sort of warrior fighter. She says, Cormac. He looks at his what? I think that's, I think that's at the headquarters. Cormac like looks back towards the smoke and begins to walk slightly faster. And remember, Cormac is carrying a carriage that's probably got two tons in it. The only reason it's moving is because Cormac is two tons. Okay, not really, but he looks like he's two tons. He can't exactly run. As you get closer, it becomes more and more obvious that the headquarters of the gauntlet, which you can see because you're at a higher elevation than the actual city of Afkala, is smoldering. Cormac doesn't say anything to the team and he begins to run. Running, carrying his carriage. The small halfway man named Barwick is behind the carriage trying to make sure none of the gold and treasure falls out of it as it goes. Kind of like pushing it back up in and picking up coins as it goes. Like just trying to make sure that all the treasure stays there. He yells forward. He goes, Alexstrasza, go ahead. And she begins to look. This well-built, muscular, athletic drow runs fast. And she proves it in this instant. And as soon as the gauntlet team members this company called the Outsiders, get to the gates. The soldier walks up. We don't hear through the pounding rain what the soldier says to Cormac. But he looks at them and points at the cart, and they nod. Amongst them, these soldiers are priests, holy men, holy women, of the goddess Joaquin. We can see their symbols on their chests. They nod in a very vigorous agreement with whatever it is that Cormac's saying. And they tend to the cart, 
as Cormac begins to walk down the streets. Cormac's now running. His big, heavy metal boots clank like a steam engine train down the cobblestone streets. People make way. Alex Draws is keeping right up with him. The other party members are, are, are there as well. They turn the last corner, and there, the headquarters of the gauntlet, almost damn near centered of the city. It looks like someone took a giant sword, like a titan, and just cleaved the building almost in half. The building is damn near bifurcated and splayed open. Smoke rises from it, and this is where the battle took place. There are dead soldiers everywhere. In the dozens, but that's a lot for this confined space. This battle was close quarters fighting. It happened in an area no larger than like a small courtyard. It was a massacre. As soon as Cormix, he stops, just like awestruck, like looking around. We see him mouth the words, what happened? Up the steps, about 30 steps rise up to meet the stone and wood building that is the headquarters of the gauntlet. A small halfling is sitting on the steps in the pouring rain. In front of her, between Cormac and there, there are small fires being built to keep the area like lit as the evening begins to come in, and the bodies are being stacked in like, these are members of the gauntlet, these are the mercenaries. They're separating them. You have to identify next to the kin. There's all the things you have to do. These gallant members, the ones who survived, some of them still bearing the wounds of battle, have taken upon the grim task of sorting this all out. The small woman that's on the steps, her normally bright platinum hair, which she dyes random colors depending on whatever day it is, which is usually set to giant pigtails. She has one pigtail left on the left side. The right side is just all about her face. She's covered in soot and like the blast that you would go through if you like were caught in the middle of magical fire spells and like the soot. You can see the grime and the tears and rain mix down and like pour it down her face. And she's just sitting like kind of like slowly, gently rocking back and forth on the steps. Her name is Mevaketso. She is one of the gauntlet members that belongs to Dragon Company. Mevaketso, otherwise known as Metha. It's an up-and-coming adventure with McGill. She's not as brash as most people would think, based on the way that she acts. The little, the little gnome that's sitting there looks up, and her eyes kind of open. Her bottom lip begins to quiver, like she is fighting back tears. She stands up and begins to walk down the steps. Cormac and his team walk forward and he says, Little little one, what, what has happened? They, they attacked us. A surprise attack, Cormac. Omni and mercenaries. There had to be a hundred, two hundred. You don't think that there was two hundred. The huge... And imagine this scene in juxtaposition. He kneels down on the steps so that he's looking her face in the level because she's like three feet tall. And he looks at her and he puts his big, giant, meat, mitt, maw of a hand like on her shoulder. And as soon as he touches her, she just starts to cry. Not because of any power that Cormac holds. It could be the showing of affection after a time that probably caused her some PTSD. We don't know. Where is Cecil? Mepiketso, Mepe. There, there was, uh, there was cowed wizards as well. She, she wipes her face, smearing the dirt and the grime across it, as she does. Mepe, where is Cecil? The half-orc states slowly with determination. We weren't even supposed to be here. Mepe, Cecil, where is he? He moves his hand behind her head, trying to, like, get her to focus. She bursts into tears and just wraps her arms around Cormac. They must know each other. This wouldn't be a normal interaction of people who do not know each other. Um, even if they're both in the gauntlet, and she's just crying. We can now see from Cormac's, like from across Cormac, that something dawns on him, and his eyes begin to get really big. 
Cormac, I need you to be really strong, okay? Cecil really needs you right now. Cormac immediately begins to stand, and we see him swallow very hard. She can't do much to hold on, so she kind of just lets go as he stands. Just then, at the top of the steps, where the building's bifurcated, we see a drow priestess come around the corner. This is Vro. This is the leader of Beholder Company. They weren't supposed to be here. They shouldn't be here. The most beautiful drow woman that you've ever laid eyes upon in your existence. With the most platinum white hair, but it's set to giant ringlets that go all the way down to her knees. Her armor is beaten and bruised and twisted and torn. Her body co is covered in scars. She's a priestess. She could have healed them, but she just hasn't. In fact, there is a um, shaft of an arrow without its fletching still stuck in her left shoulder cap that she just broke off. We couldn't have been too long after the battle. This must be, like, really close. But none of that matters. Because in the priestess' hands, she holds a swaddled baby. We can tell from here it's a baby. Cormac looks at Vro, looks at Mepe, looks at the baby. He does it about three more times. Barwick's hand raises up and just touches this, like the back of the, the giant half-orc. He's not sure what's going on, but even he can sense that there's, that this is a bad scene. Cormac says, Cecil? Jacqueline? And he just says that. The gnome doesn't say anything. She just begins to weep even harder. The woman is soothing the baby, the drow woman, Vro, leader of the older company. Mepiketso says, I'm sorry, Cormac. We, we could have, we, we could have, if we had just gotten, Cormac begins to jog up the steps. And she doesn't try to talk to him anymore. The half gets to the top of the landing. No one in his company follows him. Cormac alone reaches the top of the steps in the landing. Soldiers inside the headquarters of the gauntlet are still trying to like put things back together, put out fires. And as they see him, the ones inside the building, they won't look Cormac in the eye. And he just kind of like looks at him and keeps going. The scowl begins to grow across his face. At the top of the steps, he reaches what would be his brother Cecil and Jacqueline's room. The door is slightly open. To the left of the door stands Henry Morning, priest of Lathander, member of Dragon Company. He is on his knees and praying, holy symbol resting in his fingertips. He looks up and breaks prayer and says, Oh, by Lathander, you are here. Hopefully you can do something about this. Cormac is, just kind of gets up there. He's not saying anything. He's looking across the scene. To the right of Henry Morning is Marina the Evoker, a number, another member of the Gauntlet, a newcomer to Dragon Company, serving under Cecil with Henry. She's sitting on her knees, hands on them, looking through the thin crack of this open wooden door, this open door. The inside of this door is covered in arrows, like a pin cushion. And we can see inside the room a fire like flickers and crackles, and that's that one solid beam of light coming out meeting her. The building's been shed in two, so she's just sitting in the pouring rain. This small, beautiful woman um, of dark hair and wearing the robes of an evoker, the robes of a wizard. Um, just has a look on her face of just distress and sadness at what she's looking at inside. The other members of the Dragon Company are out here. We don't know where they're at. We can hear the fire crackle and pop, but no other sounds coming from inside the room. Cormac leans his head in and looks inside, and what we see is surreal. This round room, this round part of this building, which was the Basically, the bedroom and headquarters kind of, you know, think of it like being a studio apartment. If we were, like, in the Dark Ages. Belonging to Cecil Dartraft, Cormac's brother. Jacqueline Dartraft, Cecil's wife, and a child. It looks like someone set off a sphere of annihilation here. There are arrows in every single place that can hold an arrow. There are dead men. There's probably 30 plus dead men laying all over this room. 
Some of them are splayed over the couches. Some of them are dead in the bed. Some of them are like coming through the window and laying there. They've been hit in the arms. Some of them have five arrows in their bodies. Some of them have arrows in the back of their skulls, weapons drawn. The body of a wizard, we can tell by his robes, lays in the middle of the room. He has minus one head. It sits sitting up like someone has placed it on its decapitated neck in the middle of the room because how it could have landed like that we draw ourselves closer to the middle of the room burn marks are on everything magic was used in this room a lot of it sitting in a chair a slight rocking chair is a, is a large man not Cormac size but he's wearing blue painted plate mail head to toe his helmet still adorns his head the plate mail is now purple because that is how much blood stains his armor. To his left is a small baby's crib, riddled with, there are, there are two kinds of arrows in this room. The vast majority of them came from one, one side. And what I mean by that is they all use one kind of colored white fletching. The rest of the arrows in this room are all random. Almost as if we can tell who was, who was firing one arrow and who was firing the other. Whoever came in this room fired a, an assault of arrows at this crib. It is riddled with arrows. But we saw the baby before. Unless it's a different baby, but that wouldn't make any sense. Someone tried to come here and kill this child. Like immediately. The man in blue plate mail is holding a beautiful red woman in his arms. He has her cradled and he's rocking back and forth in the chair. Her body is lifeless, and she wears an evening gown. She is still clutching her bow, as though she died and a rig of mortar set in, and she will not let it go. Any arrows and wounds and blades that were stuck in her have been removed. She looks like she was assailed by 40 people at once. In her left hand is one of her arrows. Now we know where the white fletching arrows came from. She fired probably 60 to 75 arrows. Where she got them from, we have no idea. But Jacqueline was known to be the best archer that the gauntlet had ever seen. And she proved it that day. Her body is pale, even for Jacqueline. And I don't mean just like the fact that she has left us and moved on to the next life. Her body is exceptionally pale. And strange black webbing like rises across the top of her skin, stretches all over her. The woman kneeling, looking through the door, the evoker, Marina. Cormac, you have to do something. He won't come out and he won't let us go in there. It took all we could, everything we had just to get the child out. From inside the room, we hear a booing voice. Leave me alone! He flings a silver saucer dish, like a serving tray plate, across the room, and it hits the door with such force, the door, like, kind of, like, reverberates. And the metal tray hits the ground and clangs and makes all these sounds. And everyone within the area, like, kind of shudders for a moment because it's the only sound that's different from the rest of them. And it catches everyone by surprise. The people down there, Barwick, can hear the yell. Cormac just begins to open the door and walk in. He steps over Marina the, the, as he does, because he's seven foot something. He just strides right over her. Cecil Darkdraft looks to the left, and we can see that Cecil is not doing well. From the open, T-faced helmet he wears, we can see an arrow coming from the outside, like it caught him in the face. There's a haft of an arrow coming from the bridge of his nose, out. He has an arrow in his left leg, the, the, the blood around it has begun, is like, is blackened. And although we're not there, we can almost smell the infection setting. He's missing two fingers, two fingers on his, his right hand. They've just been completely cut off. And the blood has blackened and hardened. And he has not treated the wound. There was a fight here. Cormac says, as he rate, puts his arms up, and he goes, Brother, it's, it's me. Cormac, we can bring her. That's all he gets to say. Before Cecil looks at him and says, No! We can't! They made sure of that. C 
Cease has been crying so much he has no more tears left to shed. He slowly pulls his helmet off and just drops it to the ground, cradling Jacqueline's body more in his right arm to hold her. And he like presses her close and he puts his face to hers. The arrow that has gone in has blown out his left eye. This is a giant open festering wound where his eye was. His lip begins to quiver and he begins to try to cry. And all that comes out is a dry, wheezing, kind of like hyperventilation. There's nothing left. We can see that he has vomited across his chest from the sets of crime. Cormac kneels down next to his brother and is now passed away sister-in-law. I said, leave us alone. Cormac says, I'm not going to do that, brother. He goes to put out his hand and Cecil backs it away. And then he actually lifts his left hand and punches his corner right in the mouth. Everyone outside the room like buckles for a second. And he slowly just moves his head back and he says, I'm not going to leave. He starts rocking. Cecil begins to rock back and forth. We can't bring her back. I couldn't save her. I can't raise a child by myself. He just starts screaming. He goes, Moments! If I had been up there moments earlier! I am so sorry, Jacqueline. I am so sorry. I love you, I am so sorry. Cormac puts out his hand and places it tightly on Cecil's shoulder. Cecil kind of like pulls away for just a moment. And he says, Swing at me, stab me, do whatever you need to do, brother. But you need to get a hold of yourself. You have something you need to do. Are you going to fall apart and let them get, and you can see that now, Cormac's beginning to lose it. This is his brother, not by blood, but this is the Dark Draft family that they adopted him. This is all he's ever known as family. This is the man he looked up to, he idolized what he wanted to be. And he says, you're just gonna fall apart? Do you think that's what Jacqueline would want? You're not gonna get vengeance? You're not gonna go find who ordered this? He begins to like gently shake him. Cecil looks like it may be starting to work. But I, I can't, I can't do this without her. I have a daughter to raise, Cormac. Am I supposed to go off to war and let someone else raise my daughter? And he goes, Cormac says, and is your daughter supposed to grow up knowing that her father didn't seek out who killed her mother? Because you shut your fucking mouth. And he goes, no, you shut your mouth, brother. This isn't who you are. This isn't who you taught me to be. This isn't how you raised Edgar. We joined this because of you. You will get up. We will give her last rites. And by the gods willing all of them, if there is a way to bring her back, we will find it. But you have to pull yourself together. Cecil kind of like begins to swallow hard for a moment and he slowly begins to nod and he says you're right Kwame. this is no way for a dark draft to act and this their discussion doesn't play out anymore he slowly stands carrying Jacqueline's body he goes get out of my way and Cormac just you don't think that you don't think that even in this moment Cormac believes that he can stop Cecil from doing anything that he wanted to. Immediately everyone around the door begins to back up. We see Cecil walking to the door carrying his wife. And he grabs her by the head and he puts her head up to hers and he begins to talk to her. And we, only we get to hear what he says to her. He says, Jacqueline, I'm sorry I couldn't save you, but I will find them and I will cut them down. I will kill every single one of them. I will kill everyone that protects them. I will kill everyone that hides them. I will make their deaths long. They will taste my steel. And when it is done, I will find a way to bring you back. And if I cannot bring you back, I will join you so that we can be together. He reaches the door. Henry Morning, the priest of Lathander, looks at Cecil and says, I'm so glad to have you back, friend. I want to prepare last rites now, Cecil says. 
and he's almost speaking in this like robotic tone like he's forcing it. He goes, there is much to be done. I have things to do. Henry Morning nods. And then Cecil passes his wife's body to the priest, who immediately kneels down, facing her upon the ground, and begins to perform last rites. Last thing we see is the rest of the gauntlet members begin to come up the stairs, all together. Cormac re reaches his big tree trunk of an arm around and places it upon Cecil. And Cecil, in a moment of emotion, just reaches up, grabs his big brother, not his big brother, his little brother, but his gigantic, gargantuan brother's arm, and mouths the word, thank you. The wizardess is trying to attend to Cecil's wounds. There's an arrow stuck in his face. And his eyes are blown out. Henry Morning is trying to perform the rites as the tears roll down his face and, like, fall upon Jacqueline's body. And the rest of the gauntlet members get to the top of the stairs. Some of them some of them begin to put their hands over their faces and gently cry. Other ones kneel. Some sit as they listen to the priest as he says the words giving safe passage to Jacqueline's body. The land beyond.